Produced by Victoire. Victoire gives a special thanks to the EWF, Empire Wrestling Federation, and Mr. Jesse Hernandez, as well as SoCal Wrestling TV. Find the app on Roku. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Power and Glory, the podcast. You want to discover the power of truth? Then you have come to the right place. Across from me on the screen, you'll see my partner in justice, Mr. Paul Roma, right there at the bottom of your screen. I am your host, Emir. And today we're joined by two special guests uh, at the top of the screen. Uh, right across from me, you'll see former WWE superstar Raymond Rougeau. He was also a guest on my other Victoire podcast interview. And of course, Mr. Mario mm-hmm. Mancini right there at the bottom. Yes. He's quiet now, everybody, but you never know when he's going to just pop out and say something. So we'll, uh, you never know. But regardless, let's kick this one off, Paul. Um, obviously, yes, sir. Obviously, you and Raymond were both involved in tag team wrestling, two experts in the field. So I wanted to kick it over to you so you guys can really get into the dynamics of what makes a great tag team in general. And then talk a little bit about some of the matches that you you two may have had against each other back in the golden era. So kick it over to you, Paul. Well, well look, I just want to say it's great to uh, see him again. Um, and it's great to see him outside of the ring, so I don't have to deal with him inside the ring. Uh, all joking aside, though, he was uh, he was very easy uh, to work with in, in wrestling all those years. Um, laid back. Uh, I found him to be very laid back, unlike his cohort, uh, his partner in crime, <laughs> uh, Jacques. Um, but Jacques wasn't 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 bad. Um, he was very opinionated, which in that business you had to be. And, and I, I get that. I understood that. Uh, but, you know, Raymond, um, they were easy to work with, which was which was a which was a blessing because you had a lot of tag teams back in the day, you know. I mean, for the most part, some of them were maybe majority were pretty decent to work with, but there were a few that were a little rough and and they made life a little difficult. And, you know, when you see your name up against them on the board, you kind of like cringe, like, oh, you know, Um, that really wasn't the case with the Rougeaus. And and I appreciated that. Okay, now over to you, Raymond. So what were your recollections of working with Paul and during that time on the tag team division? Well, uh, likewise, it was always a pleasure to work with Paul. And uh, Paul also was pretty laid back, pretty easygoing. Uh, Actually, Paul and Jim were both pretty easy. Um, Paul was always calm, cool, collected, never exasperated. No matter what the situation was, we can sit, we can talk it out. And, uh, you know, he's a pretty cool headed guy. I enjoyed working with him. It's and like Paul said, when you look on the board, you see who you're working with. If I saw it was Paul, I'm like, yes, easy night. <laughs> you know? so, so that that was fun. But yes, and I agree with you, Paul. Yeah. That sometimes you look on the board and say, oh man, you know. Yeah. But th- that wasn't the case with us. It, it was a pleasure to work with you. Yeah. Thank but, you. Thank you. But the two of you, in terms of personality wise, you were similar on some level. Both of you were extremely dedicated and professional. Like you said, not into the party life, not into right. any of that. You two excelled at the, you know, just staying on the course, straight and narrow. And it, I think it came through. Mario, tell us your uh, experiences with the fabulous Rougeau brothers. Well, unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to work with them. I don't think so. You could have uh, said the pleasure. Yeah, I, I, didn't have the ple- <laughs> I didn't have the pleasure of working with you guys, unfortunately. But you know what? I'm going to tell you something right now. Um, as as a guy who who broke in to the WWF six weeks after he was 18 years old, and I, I guess they, the Rougeaus came around probably by the time I was 20 or 21, and I watched them. And, and not only did I watch them in the ring, and you're going to think I'm nuts, but I learned something from them. And I watched them after the match. I watched them when they came, but not not in not in the way it's going to sound. I watched them when they came out of the shower and they went into their bag, 
And I just watched them the whole time. And I, I forgot who was sitting next to me. And I looked down and I said, not that I was not that I was dirty or anything. I mean, I, I had a lot of stuff and I, I, you know, deodorant and cologne and soap and all the, uh, you know, you'd carry hydrogen peroxide, alcohol in your bag. I mean, it was a, a, like, a... but I looked at the guy next to me and I go, I think we got to pick up our game here on hygiene. These guys are like the cleanest guys I've ever seen in a business. <laughs> I go, they are apps. I go, I, I, I go, they make us look like slobs. I go, do you see the, these guys go through and i paid attention to that and i started going out and get some getting other stuff as a young kid you know what i mean you you, you think you got it down and then you're like wow those i mean extremely extremely professional um gentlemen in the dressing room i mean but you know always smiling they i've never seen them you know Unfortunately, they had episodes where where you know they they were ticked off, but I've never seen them lose their temper or anything like that. They cared about what they were doing out there. They would I'd see them both talk to each other constantly before their <clears> matches. <throat> Just when you're a young kid and you're watching, the, I always obviously watch the guys that were going over. I paid attention. I watched and I wanted to learn. But these guys, but the Rougeau brothers were a class act. There's no doubt. They were they were class A, man. Just mm -hmm. class A guys. Uh, and what about the difference? Now, obviously, Paul, you worked with partners that were not your brother. But Raymond, you worked with your brother. So what kind of, for someone who's aspiring to get in the pro wrestling world today, and especially tag team wrestling, and let's just say they are working with a sibling, um, how do you, obviously, because there's sibling rivalry, how did you figure out a, a working arrangement where you didn't drive each other totally insane? Well, the, the, especially with the schedule we had, being on the road, uh, you know, 24, 25 days a month back then, <clears throat> the um, time change, you know, you're always messed up, don't sleep. So sometimes you could have, your patience could be a little uh, short at times. <laughs> Main thing is you have to respect that and you have to accept that your partner could not be in a good mood, could not feel good that day and maybe won't be as nice as he normally would, mm. but you have to give each other the space. I say, I think that's, you know, my brother and I did it at, at certain times. There were certain times that, yeah, if you're with somebody 25 days a month and traveling to Europe, back to California, back to New York, I mean, you don't even know where you are, which yeah. time zone you're in. You just get cranky. And and there were times where we had to take a little space outside of the ring to just give each other the space, you know, because no matter who it is, if you're with those pre people all the time and over the years now, you're not talking for a week or two, you're talking years, little stupid things will get on your nerves that shouldn't normally, but they do. Mm -hmm. So if you understand that and you can, you can reason it and, you know, take a step back and just say, look, I need some space. You know, just for an example, something stupid. My brother always used his deodorant was in an air can, you know, spray deodorant. Yeah. It bugged the head out of me because, in the, you know, we share hotel rooms. You get up, put that spray on, and it's in the air everywhere. It's like, oh, <laughs> I can't handle that anymore, you know? Yeah. And that's stupid, but it does get to you day after day after day after day. Yeah. So at points, I say, look, let's just take separate rooms for a while. You know, this way I can have my own space. He can have his own space, which is normal and I think a healthy thing to do. And and this fact that we are siblings, it could be a plus and it could be a negative because you carry things from your childhood. You carry things when you're teenagers. But at one point, fortunately, when we got to the WWFE now, mm -hmm. <clears throat> We we had passed those stages and we had attained a certain maturity yeah. where we could speak to each other, but at the same <clears> time, <throat> respect what the other one's going through and living. And we don't, everyone doesn't live through situations the same way. I'll give you just an example. Mm. When we'd walk into the dressing room, you know, a lot of the boys will say, hey, how was your day? For me, it was fine. We could have three canceled flights, two delays. Uh, everything's fine. Everybody's going through that. My brother had a habit when he came in, oh man, 
our flight was canceled for such a place. As, you know, and then we were stuck. We didn't have time to eat. We got in late. Didn't have time to check in. We're at the building. I told them, I said, the guys don't care. Yeah. They just asked me during the flight, how was your day? It was fine. Everybody goes through that. And if everybody starts going through the aches they had or the frustrations during the day, all we'd hear about is bitching all day long. But for him, that was his way of expressing, I don't know, he says, they're asking me. So I'm telling them. Yeah. I said, they don't want to know it, <laughs> you know? But it's little things like that to how we re react differently to different circumstances. But at one point, I think the bottom line is you have to accept and respect differences that yeah. the other person won't necessarily think like you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wise, wise advice right there. Um, Paul, obviously you weren't tag team with your, your brother, in any circumstance, but you work with uh, different personalities. You were involved with the Young Stallions. We've had Jim Powers on here. Uh, pretty wonderful um, with Paul Orndorff and then Hercules, Power and Glory. So how was it like for you? I mean, I can't imagine if you'd have been teamed with Mario. I just got to segue into that. I oh, mean, we, probably, we probably never get anything done. No. <laughs> but. but, but no, wait that, a minute. Don't don't leave out S.D. Jones. Oh, S.D. Jones. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, we'd be stopping at every restaurant every 10 minutes. Uh, Chinese food, of course. Of course. Um, and never make it to the building. You know, yeah. something like that would happen. But yeah, um, <clears throat> let me let me touch on what Raymond said. All right. Uh, so, yes, he's correct. And he's not correct. Mm -hmm. and I want to make you understand why. He is correct when he says the boys didn't care. They don't care. They're just being polite, like he said. Hey, how was your day? But he's incorrect because they did care when they wanted to hear how miserable your day was. Okay. They cared about that. Yeah. Okay? They yeah. wanted to hear your pain. Yeah. Raymond, just as he stated, come in. Hey, Raymond, how you doing? Good, good. How are you? Good. Okay. You know, put his bag get his stuff out, um, you know, all lined up. That's how he was. Uh, Jacques, he he explained them just like it was. He'll carry on for 10, 15 minutes. You know, he'll piss, bitch, and moan of what went on and what transpired and, you know, every every hair that's out of place. Yeah. So those are those are the two differences, probably why they got along as brothers. But, you know, again, as brothers, siblings, you have that. Yeah. Um, Ray and I did the same thing as far as um, when we when we checked in hotel rooms. So what we do is we stayed, we roomed together until we got to a inexpensive hotel. That hotel, and uh, people are going to really date me on this one, when hotels are like $20 a room mm -hmm. a night, we get to one and we're like, oh, we'll get separate rooms tonight. This is cheap. If the room was $50, we split it. So for the most part, we did as they did. We would uh, room together, save money because we're splitting the cost of everything. And then when we got to some place, you know, maybe towards the end, maybe the start of the next trip, if it was really inexpensive, that's when we separated um, and, and stayed to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, did the boys care? No, they wanted to hear your pain. They wanted to, they wanted to feel it, you know, <laughs> that they, they think it's great. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. All right. And now, and Mario, what about you? Because now you teamed with some guys in some of your matches as well. So working with different people, different personalities, how did you prepare for that? Did you spend time with these guys? Were you just thrown together? Uh, was it instinctual? It was just thrown together and it was just for um, two minutes and 40 seconds. So um, because I'm a jobber, I'm not an enhancement talent. I'm not a human Viagra. I was a jobber. So my tag team partners were, were our our lifespan was two minutes and 40 seconds. However, I did have house shows uh, as a tag team partner. I had a victory with Sweet Hansen. Um, but I have to say that, um, you know, I've tagged with Roma before. Um, I I guess my the best tag team partner uh, I, I, I had for a length of time was uh Dave Paradise uh for Paradise Alley and you know that that was just you know those are local shows we didn't go on the road we didn't have to you know we didn't drive 200 miles 
Uh, other than that, it was Gino Carabello, where we did travel and we were together. And um, Gino, Gino, Gino always wanted something, right, Roman? So he always, always wanted, he always wanted something. I mean, he, I got to a point, believe it, this is a true story. I got to a point where I called George Scott for him and asked George Scott if he could give him some bookings. He drove me crazy. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I used to hang out with him in Long Island when we were, when we were on the road and everything, but I, I have very limited, I have very limited, uh, tag team, uh, partners. I, you know, I wish, you know, Gino and I just for nostalgia, Gino and I for like four or five matches, uh, on Rocco Lapenta's tour, uh, from Avon, Connecticut, we revived the Sicilians and we went out there in overcoats and black gloves and, and uh, fedoras and everything. Um, we, we recreated this Tony Altamar and Lou Albano, the, the Sicilians, but that was, that was nothing. That was a flash in a pan. And then, we went out there with bandanas around our heads and bandanas around our ankles and wrists because Duran Duran just came out with that song Wild Boys. Oh, yeah. And he, <laughs> yeah. So that was our name. Our name was the Wild Boys. And that lasted about, I don't know, a month. So basically, I was, I was still scratching and clawing in the WWF, praying to God that if I paid my dues, at somehow some way i'd get a break but you know mostly singles um out there in a, in a, in house shows too so unfortunately i because of strongbow i do have and tony altamar i have good psychology when it comes to uh tag team wrestling i'm a i'm a big false tag guy it's my favorite because it still work the false tag still works it's a beautiful thing. The false tag is the best. Yeah. So, you know, that's that, that's about it, Amir. Yeah, no. But you did do a lot of great things. So again, Madison Square Garden, you can't forget. You were there, Mario. So 20-something plus thousand people. You wrestled in front of that crowd, you know? so I did. I was I was on the phone with that gentleman last night, as a matter of fact. It was Tony Atlas and oh. Madison Square Garden. I was I had quite the conversation with Mr. Atlas last uh last night. So yeah. All right, quick, quick to finish off this tag team, the lightning round. So, Raymond, up to you. You were there. Obviously, you could be partial you know, to yourself and say we were the best tag team. But other than the fabulous Rougeau brothers, who did you really admire during that time? Oh, there, there were, you know, it was a very rich time for tag teams in the WWE back in the 80s. There were a lot of good tag teams. Uh, you had the Heart Foundation. You had the Rockers. You had the Islanders. Uh, Orient Demolition. Express. Pardon? The Orient, Orient Express. Express. Yes, also. There, there were a lot of good tag teams, uh, you know, back in the day. Demolition. Demolition. Yeah. 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 yeah the Ro Road Warriors. Uh, you know, th there were a lot of tag teams that were very good. I, you know, the thing is, to, to pick one as the best, it's difficult because each one had its strengths and weaknesses. But all in all, there were a lot of good talent out there. A lot of great talent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think you know they were unique to each other. Yeah, they all like you said. They all they all brought something to the table. That's what made them what they were. Um, you know, different yet good. Um, you know, was one better than the other? No, I mean, sure to the fans, mm -hmm. they're going to say it because it's like you know. Oh, I like the Yankees. Oh, I like the Mets. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so they had their choice, and they had plenty of choices. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they got the, the best of the best when it came to tag teams. You had the British Bulldogs. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, there's just, my goodness, the Rockers. I mean, we're not even we're not even naming all of them, uh, yeah. all the tag teams that there were. There were some, so, there were some, um, there were some greats there. Some yeah. greats, yeah. The palette was so diverse. And so, like you said, Paul, everybody brought something to the table and everybody brought something different to the table. That's what was fun. It wasn't like yeah. you have three 14s and one is like a copy of the other. No, everybody was unique and everybody brought something different. I think that's yeah. what was great about the teams. 
Yeah. You you had what? Wyndham and Rotundo? Yeah, also. Right? I mean, gosh, if you start thinking, now you start, you know, have, I think they put like Jim Duggan with somebody and it worked. Yeah. You know, I mean, the guys were so talented. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Mario says, oh, you know, I, I, I was a jobber. He They could have put Mario with anybody they wanted to put him with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there was the talent. It didn't matter where they were on the card. Um, they could they could enhance anybody and, and gel with anybody because everybody was that good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, what a what think about it. If if you were a professional team and you have to dip into that pool, every time you pull somebody out, you have a home run. It's it's a winner. Well, you know, you know, when you look at it, when you look at it, what what Vince did back in the 80s when he, he became worldwide, he went and took let's say good talent from every territory and made a super territory about it. So that's why when you look at it, you've got all these people. Yeah. He took basically top talent from everywhere to make one super territory. So it's, it's hard to say one is better than the other. You even take uh, Sheik and Volkov, you know, yeah, there you go. Forgot Volkov. About them. they weren't the greatest workers. They were not no. easy to work with. Because, you know, Sheik was very limited in his, what he could do, and Nikolai was very clumsy. But they brought something to the table. And for the fans, they came in, and the, the fans hated them. Why? Because they had a story to tell. They had the right gimmick, the right time, the right look. You know, the two personalities worked well off each other. You know, for us, yeah. working in the ring wasn't that easy. But... You know, for the fans, they had something. You talk, uh, Bob Orton and uh, Don Morocco. Yeah, another yeah, friend. another one, another yeah. one. You know, and we, the more we could talk, more we. Oh yeah, what about so and so? Yeah, there was a lot of talent back then. It was. It, yeah. it was a. Great, it was a great time. You are thinking about the Twin Towers, the Big Boss Man and Akeem, yeah. the Bushwhackers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it just went on. Mario, who was some of your uh, or favorite teams in that era, if any? Demolition and the Heart Foundation. Okay. You know, it is, it, it, you know, I wonder to this day how I missed Power and Glory. I don't know how I missed them. And I didn't look up at the board and see me, you know, I, I wish because, you know what I mean? It was always very, um, how can I, what word can I use? It was always comforting to look across the ring and know that I was in there with Roma. That's the biz. That's the beauty of the business. Uh-huh. When you're when you get to work with someone that you're really close with, that that's a beautiful thing. It's it's much better, like Roma says. It's much better than looking up at the board and going, "Ah, oh, man, yeah. you know who's it? Who's this guy?" Especially me, because I did a few debuts, uh-huh. so I'm like, "Ah, oh, man," you know what I mean? It's like when I did Bundy's debut in, in oh, March yeah. of '85, and Chris was sitting there. I'll never forget the white Fruit of the Loom t-shirt he had on. He had canvas sneakers on. And he's sitting there, Amir, he's sitting there like this. And I'm like, hi, I'm I'm, I'm Mario Mancini. We're, we're working together. He's, uh-huh. I said, um, he goes, Chris, nice to meet you. He goes, I used to be a jobber here. I'm like, wow, that gives me a lot of hope, you know? <laughs> Even though I'm not, you know, six foot six, 435 pounds, it still gave me hope, you know. Yeah. And and I kind of looked at him for a couple seconds, and then he said to myself, he's going to kill me. Mm. So I, I'm like, hey, <laughs> I just want you to know yeah. that I'm going to sell really good for you out there. I mean, I'm going to sell like... <laughs> The, the a firework display on the fourth of July. That's exactly what I said to him. I said, so everything's gonna be okay out there. And we locked up an event. He pushed me off a couple of times and we locked up and he leaned me over that top rope. And I saw that forearm came down and I thought I thought I broke my clavicle and I'm like, oh, this is not gonna be good. I mean, he was just nervous. Yeah. But you know, we ended up working another four or five times together and and we became really good friends and um we had a good time in there after that but sometimes you don't know who's up on the board like you know when when i look up at the board and i see me and bundy i, I was like christmas i go running up to him like a little kid chris you and me 
You know what I mean? Because I'd watch Strongbow fill out the board on TV. I'd watch him, you know, because I'd wait for my name. I'd watch him write it on the board. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I'd go up to the, the, the Ted, I, the DiBiase, and go, Ted, you and I go again. <laughs> That's. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know, Mario, it's like I said, we're gonna we're gonna debut on this show at some point. Or hey Roma, Mario story time. And it's gonna be animated. So viewers, just take note of that. Uh gentlemen, before we go into our next subject, Paul, we we completely forgot at the top of the show. You know what we need the fans to do? Yes, I know exactly what I need them to do, like right now, and con just continue every time they come on to do it. Subscribe. Boom. Powerplex, hit that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the likes. Share it with your friends and family. We greatly appreciate your support here. Yes. A uh, couple of announcements. Going across your screen right now, you will see the Power and Glory, the podcast t-shirts. They will be available on pre-order in November. There is an email address in the description of this video where you can send us your information, your details, how many T-shirts you want, and we will make sure those are ready to be mailed out, hopefully before Christmas. Uh, also now coming across your screen, Hey Roma, the podcast, which returns next, uh, well, actually, it was supposed to be Wednesday, but Mr. Mancini, uh, will you be making As a pedicure? <laughs> those were, listen, yes. Amir, those, Roma, you got to explain me to Amir. Those were all listen, ribs, all of them. I, I, listen, I'm all laughing. Ribs, Amir. I'm laughing, and Amir is asking you if you could do Thursday or Friday. And I'm, yeah. laughing. I'm going, uh, uh, and Amir. then you told him that you have what a yoga class on Thursday. Uh, yeah, he, I, said, I, I, he said he's like, Raymond. well, what can you do it? Yeah, Raymond. He said, he said he's having a mud bath on Thursday. I said, <laughs> a mud I said, bath. Yeah. No, first I said I was having a pedicure. Then I said I was having a colonic. Yeah. And then I said I was having a mud bath. Every single one of them were ribs. Wednesday, I will be here with bells on. Uh, what is waiting. it, next week? Next week, next you'll week. have a col colonoscopy? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will be here with bells on, waiting <laughs> in anticipation the return, the return of hey, Roma that's been on a sabbatical for a little bit. But uh, again, thankfully, a mirror is in our life, and we get to once again at a, a regular, regular basis to go on Hey Roma, and I enjoy doing it. It is uh, a very, um, a very interesting podcast to say the least, and it, it's it's not it's not wrestling. So um, some of it is, but not all. Yeah, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it isn't. So. I, I'm really uh, excited to do this next Wednesday. I, I I can't wait to get it off the ground. Yeah, yeah, it's good. going to be it's going to be a wide open um, discussion. Uh, we get into you name it, what's going on in the world. That's what we touch on. Mm -hmm. uh, Where we have what we call our Mancini's maniacs and Roman nation. Uh, we hope that you know they're going to continue to follow us over uh, to the new podcast of uh, hey roma and and just uh jump on board with us and enjoy the ride yet again yeah yeah it's going to be a wild ride for sure um now segueing into our next topic so raymond you told us before you got on the air that last week you went out uh hunting you took yourself by yourself 400 miles north uh for anybody who doesn't know raymond is a pilot so he pilots his own plane um, so Raymond, tell us a little bit about that experience because you were telling me about how you feel after and some of the things you have to do to prep for a journey like that. Yeah, well, so and, and, and where where were you hunting? What 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 part of Canada? I was four hundred miles north of Montreal, so it's in Quebec. Um, there's a big reservoir, Manic Five. It's you know it's up the height of the bottom of Bay, James Bay and Manic Five, but it's four hundred miles north of Montreal in the woods. So there's no electricity, no phones, no internet, no nothing. And um, what's what's good is you get, you, you completely get out of touch and you live the moment. You know, like the way we are, we have our, on our phones, we have our schedules. You know, I'm the mayor in the city where I live. I'm always on schedules and meetings, this and that. There, I put my phone on airplane mode because there's nothing, so it won't search for nothing. And I'm up there. There's nothing. You live the moment. So I drink the water out of the lake. Uh, I bring some food up. 
uh, slept in a tent for a week. Uh, my brother Arma came up the next day. I spent the first 24 hours alone up there, set up tent. They came up. They stayed in the cabin next door. They were too girlish to stay in the uh, tent with me. <laughs> they needed the wood stove to heat. I didn't want any heating. Yeah. Uh, it got it got down to in Fahrenheit about 26 degrees at night. So below wow. freezing. Yeah. yeah. Wow, you were got, in a tent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's so, cold, um, brother. It's roughing it, and I like doing that. It's roughing it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you get completely disconnected. You lose all sense of comfort. And um, you're just there and you're living the moment. So for me, it's disconnecting from the world. Actually, there's nobody around. I'm by myself, you know. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of uh, Wim Hof? No. No. Paul, Mario, Wim Hof? No. Okay, so he's a, a, a man who came out with, uh, he does ice water therapy. So yeah. he was going through a lot of trauma in his life. And I think his wife uh, passed away. He had all the boys to raise. It was the love of his life. It was very, very sad for him. And to get out of depression, he started doing the cold water therapy, you know, with the ice baths and things like that. And now Wim Hof has become known as this guy that he develops a deep breathing technique. He goes out into the wilderness to reconnect and disconnect yeah. from all of these. Like you were talking about, Ray, you know, uh, disconnecting from the EMFs. We walk around in the internet web jungle it's all running yeah. through us all the time with our phones so on that note how did you feel once you i mean physically how do you feel after an experience like that physically and mentally you feel great you know i'm not saying i do it 365 days a year mm. yeah but to go out for a week like that you feel great actually as soon as i lost contact with email and stuff I shut my phone off. It took me about an hour. Well, I had another hour and 15 minutes flight to get up to where I was going. And I completely disconnected. So you're like, I'm looking. There's forests, there's mountains, there are lakes. That's all I'm seeing. And I'm, you know, looking at my instruments and I'm just flying. When I get there, I get out. There's nothing. There's no noise. There's no nothing. It was a bear that crossed on the other side of the lake. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that, you know, and I wash up there in the lake. Well, I've, it's happened over the years because I've always done that, that it got cold. There was snow on the ground. I break the ice on the shoreline to get in, to wet myself, and then to soap up and rinse. Yeah. But you just feel so good after that. You know, you're just, you're not thinking of anything. You know, you come out of the water, your ankles aren't bending too well. They froze, but that's okay. <laughs> but it, it, it's just great. It's good therapy. It's good yeah, therapy. No, it's good wow. therapy. Paul, have you, have you ever tried any ice ice therapy or Mario? I've done I've done the plunge uh, into the ocean uh, in the in the middle of winter, yeah. only on a dare from a buddy of mine, and he he went in with me. Um, but you know, doing what what Raymond's done, um, my my main concern is not worried about being in contact with the outside world. My concern would be if, you know, Fozzie Bear decides I'm his next meal. Because yeah. yeah. the one thing I, I know you can't get away from is a bear. They mm -hmm. could climb trees, they could swim, and they're fast as hell. Yeah. And at my age, I'm not fast anymore. Maybe back in the day, I'd say, yeah, I think I'll, I'll run him. Until he gets tired and says, ah, that guy's not worth it. Yeah. You know, but not anymore. Not anymore. Well, it's happened before. I was up, I went way up where the uh, Inuit people are. I went caribou hunting up there. I set up tent. I was with my son. I spent a week there on a, a riverbank. I saw 21 bears that week. And there was one night where I slept in the tent. I always slept, I always sleep with my rifle next to me, you know. So if a bear starts to come in or whatever, I'll just shoot and I'll shoot whatever's trying to come in the, the, the tent. I'm not going to say, is it is that somebody or is that a bear? No. Somebody's not, you know, I don't want to shoot them. Yeah. But uh, I woke up one morning, I unzipped the tent to get out, and I looked right next to me. There was a, a bear paw this big, this far from where I was sleeping. There was only the the material of the tent separating the bear from me. So if wow. if that hadn't been there, I would have just turned my hand like this and I would have touched the bear. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> you yeah. just turn, you look, wow. That was like a foot from my head where the bear was during the night while I was asleep and I never knew, but that, I've never been bothered by it. 
I've yeah. slept in the woods where I had no tent, and uh, all night I heard walking around. There were there were wolves, there were moose, bears. You just lay, close your eyes, not let your imagination wander too much because in the dark your imagination starts turning. But I'm hearing crack, crack all around all night. <laughs> You've got it. That, that's something. I mean, I don't know if I could do that. Mario, do you reckon you could do that? No, no. <laughs> I I would need a tent or something, or or you know, put together like you know, fifteen boxes of yodels or something to sleep under. But <laughs> um, I had, I did have some ice therapy in in uh, in my life, but then I filed for divorce and um. um. <laughs> I was that's okay a, after that. I got pretty warm. That's a therapy in its own. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> oh, but, my Lord. But, but you're going to get fun here, folks. Um, uh, but, Raymond, uh, our next topic. So as you're flying, you're talking about uh, you know potential bears and wolves and things like that. I want to know, have you ever seen anything strange in the sky in all your times flying? Any strange lights, any... Strange occurrences. No, uh, Aur auroras borealis is yes, but they're not strange. They've been, no. ex you know. But when I've been up where the uh, Inuit people are, beautiful. I mean, the sky is lit up like you wouldn't believe. You're looking at that. I'd stand outside and just look at that and be amazed. Yeah. But no, they're different. You know, UFOs or unexplained lights or something. Mm. Not really. I've, I mean, I've seen some things, but. There's probably a logical explanation. There could be an airplane that was flying in a, you know, different level, and all of a sudden the lights went out. Yeah, you know that can happen. But no, nothing uh, unusual. Interesting, because there's so many reports now. Uh, yeah. I wanted to bring this up. Paul and I were talking about this last night about UFOs, UFO hunters, ancient aliens. It's a very popular topic right now. People are saying they're seeing things. But as someone brought up to me uh, the other day, you know, with all these cameras we have, nothing's truthful as being really caught. Uh, yeah. Mario, Paul, have you guys ever seen anything odd in the sky? Um, um, well, go go ahead, Mario. no, no, you go. <laughs> all right. Well, <clears throat> my father was an air traffic controller mm. at Wright Patterson Field, and um, he told me some stories. And, you know, so as far as I'm concerned, are UFOs real? There's no doubt in my mind that they are real. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not even going to elaborate on the stories, but um, I'll give you one. How's that? There you go. Give when, someone. When, when, he's on a, when he's on the radar screen, now, when he sees something that doesn't make sense, he has to contact his superior. Well, he contacted his superior. There were four blips on the screen. And his superior said, well, they're probably weather balloons. And my dad had said to him, well, here's the problem. If they're weather balloons, they're all at the same height. And they're all moving in different directions. So if the wind current at that level is blown left, right, up, or down, then they're all moving the same way. That wasn't the case. And back then, they didn't have the jets that they have now. So by the time they dispatched uh, the planes to go up and investigate, they were gone. Hmm. But so, yeah, I um, think and that's only one. That's only one case. You know, I think we'd have to be pretty arrogant to think that we're the only living species in the universe with the millions and millions of planets and galaxies and suns. And to think that we'd be the most sophisticated, you know, creatures in the universe, there again, we'd have to be pretty egotistical to think that. Yeah, so I agree. If, if, you, if I think, is there, do I think there's life elsewhere than planet Earth? Absolutely. Why would it right. just be, you know, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, we, can, we, we can't even solve how the pyramids were built. You know, you take a thousand years ago uh, and, and what they'd done. And what they built, the structures, with basically, um, they had to have lasers to make the cuts that they did. Mm -hmm. So we're, there was no laser technology that we were aware of back then. Mm -hmm. So how did it happen? There were no well, saws that could cut that clean. 
So yes. We can't answer these questions, right? No, you can't answer that question. Uh, the other day I watched a video where a gentleman had scaled the pyramid. He was at the top of the show. So they showed the video from the top. I think it's higher than the second story of the, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. It's a, bit, a little bit higher than that, the pyramid. So they're saying that these slaves dragged those stones, positioned them perfectly over these ley lines, positioned accurately to the stars at the same time. And these were just, you know, peoples from 5,000. Well, actually, now they say 10,000 years ago. They keep changing their 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 date, carbon dating of, of uh, the Sphinx. I think the Sphinx is the key right there. Um, but yeah, it's a very fascinating topic. I've seen some stuff. But before I get to that, Mario, you're our special guest. Have you seen anything? Well, I do. I do recall being in the car once uh, on the highway. I forgot where I was. I don't think I was in the state here. Um, and I heard a strange noise. Oh, like it, it didn't sound like a plane or a helicopter. And I looked up and there was a vessel uh, in the air above the highway. And it trailing it was a banner that said buy one big mac get one free this exit and i just got off the exit right away amir and i the mcdonald's uh, by the way was right off the exit yeah well yeah i i knew you were going there somewhere mario all right i can <laughs> see that's what i can tell see i can tell if mario is telling the truth or if he's embellishing i i can tell now i knew he was going somewhere with that one ha 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 <laughs> but, but that was good he had my attention yeah, he got my. You, you know what? Over over my lifetime, I've seen things that were questionable, but I always said in my head that you know it could be a helicopter, it could be a private plane, it could be you know you see lights that aren't typical of an airplane blinking on and off or a helicopter. Like I've never seen an aircraft blink like that before. Mm -hmm. That's the extent of what I've seen, and it's always been at night. So I, you know, and you rationally say to yourself, well, I'm sure there's a perfect explanation for that, right? I think it's because uh, Bundy hit you too hard. <laughs> that could be it. Yeah, that I, could be you it. You know what, Raymond? I, I think agree. Bundy's an alien. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> aliens in wrestling. I'm sure there were quite a few yeah. of them. Uh, <laughs> now, I I had an experience where I saw three lights. A uh, friend of mine, uh, Richard, back in the UK, there were three lights. And one by one, they just went up, 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 and they faded. Right. It was very, right. very strange. It was surreal. I remember looking to him saying, did you see that? And he was like pale. And yes, I did see that. Um, right. You know, like I said, we we didn't touch alcohol. We were, I think we we're 15. So we weren't, you know, we weren't drinking. Not that I drink now, but I'm just saying we weren't intoxicated in any way. So it was it was very bizarre. It was an eerie feeling. Let's just put it at that. Um, yeah. But, you know, I'm sure there's something out there. Um, there are actually it goes back scripturally, though, Raymond, uh, Paul and Mario. We know that in the Indian texts, they talk about flying machines. Vimanas is what they call them. Vimanas. And this is texts that were written thousands and thousands of years ago. And they talk about a great war in the sky and that this false god blew this false god out of the sky and then also in the bible it talks about um uh in ezekiel uh the wheel within the wheel when ezekiel had his experience and he was taken up and you know he flew and it was a roaring sound of these this wheel spinning with eyes he describes eyes all over it which you know could have been lights something like that you know very so it's it's in our it's in our books, in our history, in our scripture. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's something, whether or not they're UFO aliens, like we think, like Hollywood has depicted. I don't know. You know, they always seem to be malevolent. So could be something else, some other force of, uh, you know, darkness. But but I don't know. I digress. But also, Raymond, <laughs> another question I wanted to go, because we're going down this rabbit hole here today. Experiment. What? What does the Earth look like to you when you're flying through the sky? Is it is it spherical at the edges or is it flat? It's flat. It's, it's flat. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, to have a, a spherical shape, you have to go up into space. Okay. You so know? you yeah. e even if you're flying on a jet, I mean, it's still flat. You yeah. know, at 30, 35,000 feet, it's still flat. So. Yeah. 
Sorry yeah. to say the earth is flat. I've seen just, it. Yeah, there you go. I just thought I'd throw <laughs> that one out there. <laughs> but uh and uh, going into our segueing into our other topic involving other pro wrestlers this week, uh, just quickly, the, the moon landing. There's so much controversy about the moon landing, guys. There even there's a new film coming out where they stage the whole thing. So um, any thoughts, guys? Do you, do you I mean, you're not going to sound unpatriotic if you do. But do you think that we really did land on the moon? I think we did. I'm, I'm sure we did. I mean, there's there. Well, look, you know, you go back a hundred years, and they'd say people are going to fly. You know, let's say normal people are going to fly their own airplanes. They think you're crazy, you know. And we do it. I flew today, you know. But the thing is, yes, why not? They're going to the bottom of the oceans with submarines. They can go into space with uh, spacecrafts. They're flying all over the sky with jets. How many jets are in the sky at every moment of the day? Mm -hmm. I think, that, you know, the thing is, people, you know, some people are skeptical. I'm not saying they're wrong for being, because there are a lot of things that they could say, well, you know, sometimes they could assume governments are trying to pull thing, pull the wool over their eyes. But I firmly believe, yes, I'm mm -hmm. sure they went on the moon. It, okay. And it doesn't even seem that far-fetched nowadays. Yeah. You know, maybe in the 60s, yeah, it's like, whoa, did they really go there today? Yeah, sure they went. Yeah. And then, and then Mario, Paul? Would you agree, or you got a different opinion? Well, I, I well, I, I think I agree, and I agree to disagree. How's that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think that yes, we eventually landed on the moon, no doubt in my mind. But I also think that it was staged, hmm. and I think it was staged in the very beginning because it was all about we have to get there before Russia. Hmm. So if we stage it and show them. Well, now they're going to back off from their space program a little bit. And, and that's that's the difference right there. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mario? Oh, oh I, I believe 100 percent. They 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 definitely um, went to the moon. You know, when my brain anyway, when I think about a question like that, not only do I think whether it's legitimate that they did go to the moon, which I say absolutely yes. I also think of the 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 days that we're living in this this 2024 where you can say listen um you know this is a covid test and you know it's a white box and somewhere somehow some way somebody will say that this is a hiv test and the box is blue that's just the society that we live in today yeah. uh -huh. Uh -huh. so speaking of society we live in today uh, something a little bit more serious, but you know we'll 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 keep positive on it. Um, there's been a backlash. Obviously, the elections are coming up here in America. Raymond, you are in politics yourself, um, so maybe you can help us with this one. Um, you know, the country here in the United States seems to be divided. I mean, it's apparent now. Uh, it's it's actually this has to be one of the most historical elections in our history. I. I you know, I never thought I'd see something like this, but it's definitely you can see it in the air. I mean, hear, feel it in the air, see it on our TV screens. Um, but also what's happening now is you're getting people speaking about out about who they support, which they have every right. You know, it's it's an opinion. It's much like an election for you to become mayor. They either want to vote for you or they don't. Um, but people are speaking out about who they want. Dave Batista. Uh, another former WWE superstar began two weeks ago. Uh, he did a, a, a video uh, about Donald Trump, basically just criticizing him, mocking him, putting him down. I thought it was tasteless myself. That's my personal opinion. Um, and then after that, um, The Undertaker and Kane were sitting with Donald Trump and they endorsed Trump. And they kind of, you know, they kind of fired back a little bit and said, hey, you can either vote for Kamala and, you know, with Dave Batista and Tim Waltz, or you vote for us, you know, with Donald Trump. But then Mick Foley, Cactus Jack, decided to throw his hat into this whole argument. And then, you know, basically uh, started again in on The Undertaker and Kane. And then Jim Cornette came in and said, you know, they basically killed their careers. I think this is going totally out of hand. Um Everyone is entitled to their opinion, correct? Raymond, Paul, Mario. Absolutely, and you know the thing is, what I I, don't, I follow the uh, 
the election every day on the news. I watch, you know, I'm following it. And it's just amazing how polarized the people are. I mean, you're either, you know, the country's completely divided. And, you know, when you look at the uh, polls, it's like nobody could guess who's going to win right now. And the thing is, it's 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 gone to a certain level to where I wish it wouldn't go. I, I mean, and when I mean a level, it's, it's lower level. I wish they would push more just what they're going to do, their policies and this and that, instead of insulting each other. You know, basically, if you say my opponent's an idiot and the other one, my opponent's a criminal, you know, what's that going to do for the country except polarize the people? I think, bring, what are you going to do to help the uh, help society? What are you going to do to help the, the poor, the elderly, the, you know, health care, whatever? Tell tell them what you're going to do. Right now, I don't know. It, it's like, for me, it's, it's gone off track mm -hmm. to a point that when you start listening, all they're doing is criticizing each other. And I'm going, I don't know, I'm not saying I'm more for one, more for the other. I'm just saying both sides, it just took a track to where people don't know. And I think they're becoming immunized, you know, or unsensitized to the, what the program is. It's, who, what's the other one going to say to insult the other one more? What are they? What dirt are they going to dig up on the other one? Yeah. It, should that should that be the debate of of an election? I question it. Mm -hmm. You know, bring what are you going to bring to the table? Why yeah. should I vote for you? You know, <clears throat> that's what I'd like to hear. But that's not what we're hearing at all. So well, yeah. well no, no you, you, look, you're not you're not hearing just that. What and also what's happening is you're getting the news media the choose sides. That's not their job. They're journalists. You're supposed to be impartial. Ask the question, get the answer, make sure you get the answer because that's your job to get the answer. Uh, whether you agree with it or not, that doesn't matter. You're going to post that answer or, or at least be on TV and get it out to the people. <clears throat> so, you know, that in and of itself becomes a real problem. And, and one of the, to, to back up what I'm saying is one of the issues right now is that Donald Trump is going to be at Madison Square Garden. And I just watched a video of a couple people, Kamala being one of them, and they're calling the people that are going there Nazis. What? I mean, what is wrong with you people? Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, look, there's going to be a civil war in the United States. It's going to be the Democrats and Republicans basically strangling one another in the streets. And, and and the politicians are doing nothing to stop this from happening. They're promoting it. They uh -huh. talk about November, you know, sixth, I believe it was, and and how Trump should have said this, that, and the other thing to stop the people from attacking, you know, the the White House and blah blah blah. You're inciting it yeah. at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. What is that? What makes you any different? There's not a person I know of. And there's not one that I know Mario knows of, and I'm sure Raymond, and I'm sure you, Amir, do you know any Nazis? No. I don't know any. No. How no. is it that you're 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 vice president of the United States, and you're calling out these people that are going to Madison Square Garden to basically it's a Nazi gathering because mm -hmm. Trump's a Nazi because he's Hitler? I mean, when does it stop? Yeah. Where, where do you draw the line? And why can't they draw the line? Well, and you why, know, Paul, why, well, yeah. Paul, what you're saying is true. You watch, and I won't say which network is saying what, but you watch CNN, it's it's clear cut, you know, who they're burying. And then you watch Fox News, it's clear cut. So the, last summer I went to Charlotte for a weekend and I was flipping from Fox News to CNN. Fox, the same news, but completely different versions because or, or you know, or because it depending one is promoting the one and the other one is promoting the other, but you take the same event and they're burying the one, you know, the, the one station is burying one for the that event, but the other one they're praising the other one for that event. I I was laughing. I just flipped back yeah. and forth. It, it's know, crazy. And, yeah, it's and crazy. Like said, the, the news, the news people are supposed to be impartial. Yeah, and that yeah. I think. You know, I think it's a whole cycle that's that's there. You have 
the candidates, you have the people that are around them, you have the population that's getting in, the news, news stations are getting in. And I think, and you're right, Paul, it's, it's a scary situation right now in the States because it, you're, you talk about a civil war. It could very be. You could have riots. You could have all sorts of things going on. Why? Because a certain candidate won or a certain candidate lost. You know, it's it's supposed to be a democracy. The people will choose. You respect the decision right. of the people. Correct. After that, you go on with your life and you hope that they do a good job. Yeah, but it, correct. You know, but, but that, that's not the that's way not it what is. That's not what it's looking like right happening. now. No, no. And, and it's all going to come down to, to just that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, without getting deep into politics, because I have my own beliefs about you know, who's running the government? It sure isn't Biden, but who's running it from behind the scenes? And that's why they want Kamala in, because she's a she's just an, an idiot. And they're going to run it, you know, tell her, you know, you go go to the beaches or go where Biden went. Do whatever you got to do. We're going to run it. You, Yeah, you're the president. Don't worry about that. You get to keep that. But we're going to take care of business. I mean, that's what they're doing for Biden. That's what they're going to try and do for her or they're going to do for her if she gets in. But at the end of the day, does it take a terrorist attack? Is that what it's going to take to bring America back together again? All the people, we the people? Because when 9-11 happened, no. the people couldn't do enough for one another. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't even find an American flag. They were sold out everywhere. Mm-hmm. This country was united. And now the Democratic Party talked about not doing this, not dividing. We're going to work with the Republicans. We're going to work with them. That's not what you're doing. And now that's not what you're saying. We're all Americans. We're all blood. And, 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 you know, we bleed the same blood. It's not about black and white like they'd like you to to believe. And and that's what it's turned into. It's, It's not now. Now it's not just black and white. Now it's Democrats, Republicans. Oh, you're mega. You know, I can do whatever I want to you because. You know, you shouldn't be thinking along those lines. No, they have a right to their opinion uh-huh. and they have a right to vote who they want to vote for. And that's what our, our military fought and died for, to give us our rights for speech and doing what we want to do as far as who we're going to vote for. Mm-hmm. Who the hell are they to call other people Nazis, which is a blatant lie? Yeah. And you're condemning the Jews. And what did they do? Mm-hmm. When does it end? Yeah. When when the when when the United States implodes, or here's even one better. China and Russia walk through our back door and take over the United States because we have incompetent people in mm-hmm. Washington. Mm-hmm. So you you take your choice of what's going to happen. But you know what? And I hope to God and I do pray to God that I am wrong mm-hmm. because I have kids I want to see grow up mm-hmm. in the United States. But it will happen, and it's happening now because China's buying out our, our farmland. They're giving just beyond top dollar, 10 times what the farm is worth. What, mm-hmm. you don't think a farmer is going to sell to them? And it's funny that they're buying properties all around our military bases. Has no one figured that out yet? What the hell's going on? Yeah. It's just a matter of time. And do you think that we, we were like this before? When Trump was in office, you got to give the guy kudos. We were safe. Nobody messed with us. Mm-hmm. Stood their ground. They were what to not do, and they didn't do it. And now we have a weak government, pathetic to say the least. And everybody's war, and they're blaming the war on on this poor poor Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. How can you blame all this stuff on him? Mm-hmm. All they keep doing is deflecting. You were in office. And then, you know, I laugh when I talk to people because they go, well, Kamala Harris. Okay. Well, she, when she gets elected, she's going to change things. She's been in office for four years. Uh-huh. She's got somebody that's half brain dead, which is Biden. She could have done a lot of business and, and changed things. But no, day one, that's all she keeps saying is day one, she's going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Where the hell have you been for four? Why aren't you doing it like in the next 12 days? Why aren't you doing it? it, it it's, it's never going to get done. 
It's very true. You know, Raymond, we see that you've seen that on TV up in Canada, I'm sure. It's very, like you said, polarizing. And they're not, um, especially now the past couple of days, a lot of the news outlets are criticizing Kamala's team for calling them Nazis and things like that. Now, I think that's you're pushing again. You're 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 taking a big leap there and something that's not there. And it is very disturbing. It's very unsettling, I think, Raymond, in the United States right now. Um, and especially hiring these these influential figures. We see it with Kamala Harris bringing on Eminem, Usher, which I found kind of interesting. But that's another rabbit hole, considering they're both loosely involved with the Diddy case. So there's a lot of strange things going on, but I definitely think that using people like Dave Batista, an actor and things like that to get an opinion across, I don't think it's necessarily fair because there are those people that will follow a celebrity, even if the decision's wrong, you know? Um, so uh, we lost Paul for a moment. I'm sure he'll be back on there. Um but no, Mario, any any thoughts on, on all of this yourself? Amir, if I told you that the heavyweight boxing champion was going to defend his title against the number one contender in Manila, what's the first thought that would come to your mind? In Manila? Joe yeah. Fraser, Mohammed, Joe Fraser. That's Joe right, Fraser. Raymond. That's right. The thriller in Manila yeah. with... Muhammad Ali and George that's Joe Frazier. That, yeah. Yeah. That's that's the first first thing that's going to come to your mind, right? So so guys, uh, on February 20th, 1939, okay, Fritz Kuhn, um, which who was a head of the Nazi Party in the United States, who who wanted to be basically the Fuhrer, the American Fuhrer here in the United States, organized a rally in which 20,000 people showed up in Madison Square Garden. So because Trump is having a rally in Madison Square Garden that's clicking people's brains from 1939 when the Nazi party actually had a rally at the Madison Square Garden. So all of a sudden, Trump's a Nazi because he's doing the same thing that the Nazi party did, mm. right? Because no, I don't think what they're saying is nobody's ever had a rally in Madison Square Garden since then, right? Uh, a political rally like that. So I, at least I don't know. I'd have to research it. But that that's, what they're, that's why they're labeling it because of... of the 19th February 20th 1930 okay yep. yeah yeah and you know what I think is making situation worse it's technology today social media which yeah. is so fast so that somebody says something boom it's all over and then it gets distorted blown out of proportion of course I think that has amplified the problem mm -hmm. yeah you talked about that uh Raymond when you came on for our interview social media now but yeah. what about you though because obviously being in that political spectrum so when you do when you campaign in yeah. the in Canada um what sorts of things should a politician do rather than you know what they're doing now uh, you know if you're if your opponent has something that is worth mentioning that the you think that it's it's important that the population knows about you can do it, yeah. but same. Bring up what are you going to do? Like I said, you know, what are you going to do to make life better? What are you going to do to improve uh, Medicare or your, your you know your living circumstances? What are you going to do? But at the same time, if there's something like I said that you know about your opponent that you think is important that the population knows, yeah, you can bring it up. Mm -hmm. But you don't. I don't think you should make your your whole campaign on just discrediting your opponent or, you know, something or like that. Scare, or scare tactics. It, yeah. It's important to, to say certain things about them because, you know, you want people to know this is what that other person represents or thinks or wants to do. You can bring that up, but then also, but in my case, what I'm going to do is, and then you can bring up the positive stuff. So you can bring up, yes, some stuff about your opponent, but not 95% of your campaign blasting an opponent. You yeah. know, a certain yeah. point you have to because you want to expose their weaknesses. I mean, it's normal. You're there to win. 
Mm -hmm. You know, so yes, you have to expose some weaknesses or flaws that they have or mistakes that they've made. You have to expose that, mm -hmm. okay, but then move on. Yeah. Do you agree or disagree with the the idea of bringing in these celebrity figures? Do you think that's, I mean, is that right? I I, I mean, what do you think, Raymond? What do you think, Mark? I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with it mm -hmm. because they're doing what they have to do. Bottom line, what's the bottom line? It's winning. Right. What do you need to do to win? So if in their opinion, they they say if we bring in celebrities that are willing to expose themselves, showing which camp they're in, they're willing to participate because, like you said, some celebrities will bring in some people that are undecided as well. If Taylor Swift says such a thing, well, geez, I, yeah, I don't know who to vote for. If she votes, I'll vote for the same person. It will right. have a certain influence. But at the same time, I don't think it's going to swing the election because people are used to that now. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's a once in a lifetime thing. Wow. A celebrity came and endorsed a certain uh, candidate. They're, they're, they're all doing it, you know. So basically, it's part of the game now. I don't think it, it'll influence the out. If it's, if it's decided between 10,000 votes, yeah, I might make a decision. Mm -hmm. But if it's anywhere, you know, if you're talking about 200,000 votes difference or 300,000 votes difference probably won't change the outcome of the election, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, I, I agree with you to, to some degree, but here's the thing. You have to let go fact check. If you don't have enough whereabouts of what's going on and you need a celebrity to tell you who to vote for, you're an idiot. Yeah. Well, you have I a mean, social responsibility. As a citizen, you have a social responsibility to check your facts and go do your research, not just listen, oh, so-and-so says to vote for so-and-so. Okay, that's what I'll do. Yeah. You have to make your own research and look deeper into, you know, into the, the, the people to make your own decision. And mm -hmm. then you could you could be surprised somebody's going to endorse one or the other. But at the same time, you have to do your own homework. If you don't do that, well, you're just following who, whatever, you know, you'll meet somebody and, and, else, vote for Trump. Okay. Then somebody else, they vote for Harris. Okay. And then when I get there, I don't know, because I've been told to vote for both. I don't know which one to vote. Do your homework. You have the social responsibility. Yeah. Right. And these, and these celebrities are on a whole nother playing field, a whole nother level. Yeah. Well, whoever gets in office, they're not being affected. They yeah. got money. Right. You people, we the people, we don't have that kind of money that right. can sustain, you know, going into a, a recession, depression. I mean, we can't do it. Right. It just can't happen. The stock market bottoms out and you're still living up in your mansion. You're still flying on your plane. You may not be running too many concerts, mm -hmm. you know, because the people can't afford to go to them. But mm -hmm. you have enough to sustain. So it's no big deal to you. But to these people, we the people. We should make a a, a a decision, you know, think, just fact check, see what's going on. Is your life better now that they've been in office for four years or was your life better four years ago? Or, you know, when when Trump was in office, you yeah. know, figure it all out. Was gas cheaper? Yes. Was prices of, of food less expensive? Yes. Was the cost of living? Less? Yes. Were we self-sufficient? Were, were we not relying on China and, and, and all the other countries to get our oil and everything? Yes. So the, where's the, what's the question? What's the debate here? Yeah. Okay. Sure. They opened up, were the borders more secure? Were they getting more secure? Yes. Were we handing out, you know, uh, um, uh, credit cards or debit cards to uh, aliens, illegal aliens coming over the border and giving them nice hotel rooms at what, $500 a night and feeding them and giving them cell phones? We weren't doing that when Trump was in office. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have a choice. It's either them or Trump. Mm -hmm. Okay, We don't have anybody else. That's who the Republicans threw in as their candidate. Mm -hmm. So you may not like him. You may not like the way he speaks. But damn it, man, look at the way life was. Look how secure America was. They blame Ukraine, the war with Russia and Ukraine on Trump. Where do they get that from? I, I think, Paul, to, to like Raymond's credit, he's like he's saying, everyone out there, look at the policies. 
analyze, like Paul saying, make the comparisons. It's right in front of you. You don't need to be swayed by Usher or, or, or whoever, or Batista, or, or even The Undertaker and Kane. You don't need any celebrity to sway you into your decision. Look at the facts, look at the opinions, and also something that has been forgotten quite a bit, common sense. Your common sense will guide you in the right direction. And it's not about a revolution. Uh, if you're if, if people are voting because they, oh, yes, I, I want to be part of the, this side of society, you're already, that's a recipe for disaster because you're already going in with a negative, negative motivation. But, but Amir, here's here's the here's the thing. Yeah. This is this is what I love about them manipulating, and, and I say this. I never want to believe that the American people are stupid. Hmm. But after the last election, I, I'm, I'm against the law on that one. Now, <laughs> here you go. Ready? Here you go. So, yes, and I'll just, use, I'll just use round numbers, okay? So gas, when Trump was $2.50. That was the lowest it was, okay? Hmm. It was probably like two bucks. But right, so it was $2 when Trump was in office. Yeah. Now you get Biden gets in office and our, our gas goes up to $5. Yeah. After three years, now that the election is coming up, they got to do something. So now the gas goes down to $3.15. Still $1.15 higher than when Trump was in office. However, this is what is pitched to the American people. And the American people, again, I say this, not all of them. that we dropped $3 off. The gas has gone down $3. It's still higher than when Trump was in office. What is it you're not figuring out? Right, right. You can't even buy a house. Astronomical. If you look around, they're building more apartment houses yeah, yeah. because no one could afford houses anymore. Right. So now all the elites are building these multi, multi building buildings with apartments in them, hundreds of apartments because yep. the American people can't afford a house anymore. They, yep. That's very true. Raymond, they're doing that out here in California. I've actually pointed to my, I've shown my wife when we've been out at the grocery store, I said, look at all that. It's like a monstrosity of apartments in an area where that doesn't exist. It wasn't there before. It's a suburban they're, area. So they're yeah. just clear. They're clearing the woods. Yep. Yep. They're just building them faster than you can shake a stick at. Every time I drive somewhere, I'm like, wow, when did those go up? Whoa. Hey, when are those? Wow. These are being built. And there's hundreds of them. Yep. Hundreds of them. They could charge any price they want because they can't afford that down payment. And so they can't get into their uh, a house. And I just heard on TV, you know what this idiot said? Build the houses, make them smaller than they could afford them. Oh, my word. <laughs> make the houses smaller so they could afford them. Oh, so man. they'll be cheaper. Wow. Seriously? Wow. So let me go build a shoebox. <laughs> I mean, that's the answer. You're an idiot because that's not an answer. But that's what he wanted the people, you know, yes. That that was his answer to the to the housing problem. Yeah, smaller there, houses. No, there is Raymond. Family you, of five can't fit. Raymond, you're up in Canada, so things are extremely different up there. But yeah, this is what we're dealing with here as the American public. Now we're dealing with a lot of. Um, we could do with someone of your calm to come in and <laughs> your sense. Well, of you know, I, I'm not living it on a daily basis, but I'm following it. I mean, I watch NBC, CBS. ABC, CNN, you know, I watch all the stations and I can see every day because I, I'm i interested in what's going to happen and how it's going on and I watch it. So I can relate to it. And I've been in the States so much and I have a lot of friends in the States. So, I know, you know, maybe somebody who's never been out of Canada could say, oh, it must, must be a certain way. But I, I spent a lot of time in the United States. So I know, you know, basically what's going on, what, what you're living right now. Yeah. And uh, it's it's not easy times. No, it's not easy times. It's, it's strange strange times. 
But we here at Power and Glory will encourage you, if you haven't voted before, if you didn't last year, make sure you do this year. Whoever you favor, make sure you vote. Allow common sense and the facts, the facts to guide you in your voting decision. Uh, we in, in, a, in a mirror, uh, a great way they could uh, actually start is by pressing that subscribe button. Hey. You start. See, you get you get comfortable. You hit the subscribe, um, and then you go out and you vote. There you go. You know what to do. Powerplex that subscribe button. That's, that's it. What do you think, Mr. Mancini? What was the question? No. Um, <laughs> li oh, listen. Uh, you know, Roma said it in a Roma way. <laughs> You're filthy. No, listen. I think it's an insult to the American people. I, 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 I just chuckle. I, I couldn't fathom a 19 year old going to the polls with her Taylor Swift t-shirt on going, well, because she said it, I'm doing it. I mean, and, and that is the vision that, that, that these politicians have in our language. They just think we're a bunch of marks. Maybe the, a lot of them are maybe sheep, you know? Sheep. Yeah. Maybe, Maybe, you know, because everybody's looking on their phones and playing with their PlayStations and, and, and stuff and and watching 90 Day Fiance, maybe, maybe they're, you know, they don't care. And that influence could make them vote for somebody because of her or Beyonce or, you know, Eminem or anything like It's just, you, you know. I think what you guys stated was was I, I can't believe the common sense just doesn't come through of, hey, look when Trump was president and look at these past four years, compare them and what do you think? You know, it, it, it should be a landslide, but it, it, it doesn't it's not working in that way because they're preying on the ignorance of the American public. And I think it's an insult. Well, only time will well, tell. Sir. Only only time will tell, gentlemen. Um, we're going to be discussing this at length next week on Hey Roma, no holds barred. So, Ooh. and yes. let me tell you, people, when he said no holds barred, we're going to peel that onion back every layer of it. Yep, I may actually have to call on the services of Raymond to come in as a moderator with me. <laughs> Uh, so, so, so we actually have a real politician with us to moderate. There you go. Debate. There you go. Um, but yeah, it's going to be wild. It's going to be the return of Hey Roma. I want to take a time to thank a true gentleman, a class act, Raymond Rougeau, for joining us this week on Power and Glory. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Nice seeing you again. Mario, yeah, it was, a it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure, Raymond. It was so good seeing you. And you, you, you know what, my, you know, I'll tell you the same thing that Strongbow told me. You know, I called him from the parking lot before I went to my first class in law school in 2002. And you know, I'm so impressed, man, because as Chief says, after you get out of a lot of guys, after you get out of this business, they they got nothing. And um, you know, so much respect that you're the mayor of your town, man. Good for you. God bless. Yeah. I appreciate. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and it's a pleasure, pleasure being on your show. A pleasure talking with you guys. Hey, it was interesting. All the subjects were interesting. And uh, hey, we'll hope for the best for the next election. Yep, absolutely. Thank yes. you, sir. Stay on the line. Be well. Stay on the line, Thank everybody. You. Stay on the line, everybody. I'll just say goodbye. So, viewers, we will see you next week right back here on Power and Glory. And don't forget, Hey Roma will be back next week. But until then, take care, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.